Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in the studio again today, and uh, for those of you joining us out in television, again, we just like to welcome you to just a simple Bible study, and yet we hope it's not too simple. But uh, we're not associated with one group. We are totally independent, and I want to keep it that way because, after all, I report only to the Lord Himself. And I realize it's an awesome responsibility to handle the Word of God. And uh, that doesn't mean that I take it lightly. Okay, now Iris has wanted me to uh, make a, a nationwide uh, announcement because so many of you are aware of these things. Our last half of the book of Revelation, which we taught at the seminar up at Concordia in St. Paul, is now ready in the video format. And uh, it's going to be uh, five hours long, and uh, you're sending that out for 25, right? So oh, that's postage paid, but it's not a six-hour, it's a five-hour video on the second part of Revelation recorded up in uh, Concordia. Also, the one that we recorded here in Tulsa back in June, many of you here in the studio were at that one, it also is a five-hour video, and it's an overall survey pretty much from Genesis to Revelation, and it is now available for also 25. Okay, now we've got all that, plus the fact that we are just now starting book number 57, and uh, for those of you also in the studio and otherwise, that means book 56 is now available. So for those of you out in television, if you want something concerning today's program, just mention book number 57, and then we can go from there. Okay, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right back where we left off in our last program. And we are in 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to go right back to the same two verses we ended with, because I didn't even come close to ending all that's in them. And it's not what's in them, it's what's not in them. And that's what I want people to see. You know, uh, I'll never forget an elderly gentleman who has now gone to be with the Lord came up to me years ago here in Oklahoma and he said, Les, he said, you're always telling us that it's just as important to see what is not in a portion of Scripture as what is. I said, that's right. And what a difference that makes that we realize that a lot of the stuff that we've heard over the years, hey, it isn't in here at least not in the rightful place. All right, now here is a good example of what I'm talking about. John is not saying one word about the cross or the resurrection or the shed blood. All right, so let's come back in to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Hereby we know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh of, is of God. What does it leave out? Nothing concerning the cross. Nothing concerning His resurrection. Only who He was. All right, then you come down into verse 3, and like we showed in the first half hour, that's the negative side. If you have someone that confesses not that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh, then He's not of God. All right, now let's just jump ahead a little bit to show you what I'm talking about. In this same chapter, go over to chapter 15, uh, verse 15. Same chapter, chapter 4, verse 15. Now, you've got to look at this with an open mind. Now, I'm patient. I think I'm more patient than most people in my situation. But when people just refuse and refuse and refuse to open their eyes and read what the book says, yeah, I get a little bit uptight. Because after all, what's wrong with reading what the Bible says? But they don't want to do it. Because, see, then they're out on thin ice. All right, now look what it does not say in this verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. What's missing? Well, the cross. The cross. Jump on over to chapter 5, verse 1. And I can remember years ago before I had the understanding of Scripture that I got now that already the Lord must have been working on my brain cells because way back, and the guy has gone on to be with the Lord, uh, this is years back, 
and uh, some of my past pastors are still living, so they'll know I'm not talking about them. This fellow is gone, but I'll never forget he preached the Sunday morning sermon on this verse. And I said afterwards, preacher, we can't be saved on this verse. Oh, yeah, we can. This is the gospel. Well, now look what it says. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that begotten of him. And so on and so forth. Not a word about the cross. So is John out in left field? No. John is exactly where he belongs because who is he writing to? Jews, who as yet have not been exposed to Paul's gospel of grace. He's on Jewish ground, as I've been saying, for the last umpteen months since we started, actually, Hebrews, but especially James and Peter and John. This is all written to Jewish believers who are saved simply by believing that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. Now, granted, every human being from Adam till the end of time will be saved by the merit of the cross. It took the atoning blood of Christ to save Adam. But Adam did not believe in a crucifixion. He couldn't. It hadn't been revealed yet. All right, now come back with me so that you'll see where I'm coming from. Portions of Scripture, especially in my Oklahoma class, we use them constantly. But in Matthew 16, Matthew 16, and now remember what you just read in John's little epistle. Don't forget that now, because we've got to tie them all together. Matthew 16. Toward the end of Christ's three years of earthly ministry. Toward the end, not up front. They're ready to go up to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. All right, Matthew 16, verse 13. And all you have to do is read it, but also be aware of what is not here. All right, verse 13. When Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, now, that's clear up in the northern borders of Israel, at the headwaters of the Jordan River. He asked his disciples, the twelve, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? A simple question. Put it in plain language today, what did he ask? Who do the people of Israel think I am? We've been out here now for three years, performing miracle after miracle after miracle. Who do they think I am anyway? Now look at their answer. And they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Some, Elijah. Others think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, Jesus in his patience comes back and says, whom do you say that I am? Do you 12 men know anything better? Whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, who was usually the spokesman, Simon Peter answered and said, Now watch this, I'm going to throw you a curve. And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died for me and rose again the third day. Does it? That's what everybody seems to think it should say. But they have no idea of a crucifixion. Luke 18 makes it so plain that as they were going up to Jerusalem, Jesus told them everything that was going to happen because he was gone. He knew. But the next verse says, And they, the twelve, what? Understood none of these things. They had no idea he was going to die. And even after he was crucified, did they expect resurrection? No. Otherwise, they'd have been outside the tomb waiting. But they didn't know he was going to be raised from the dead. All right, now the same way here. The only thing these men understood, who Jesus was. And who was he? The Son of God, the creator of the universe, but the one who had come to be Israel's Messiah and King. And that's all they were supposed to believe. Because what is faith? Taking God at his word. Well, can you believe something that God hasn't said? No. And he doesn't expect them to believe what he hasn't said. All right, so he has not said one word about a crucifixion, death, 
burial, and resurrection for their salvation. All he's been proving to them is who he was. He was the Messiah, the Son of God. Period. Now, to show you that Jesus was fully satisfied with that profession of faith, and that's what I call it, this was Peter's profession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, what does Jesus put on it? Blessings. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. You've got it right. You're exactly right. But not because you were so smart. It was because God opened your understanding as to who I am. And isn't that always the case? Of course it is. All right, let's give you another one while we're at it. Come over with me to John's Gospel. Chapter 11. Lazarus has just died. And oh, Martha's all upset because she had seen him heal the sick. And she knew that if he'd just been there, Lazarus could have been healed and he wouldn't have died. And so she is. She's kind of rightfully upset. Lord, why weren't you here? All right, and then verse 23. Here's picking up the account now. Jesus said to her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said, Oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day, but why weren't you here to keep him from dying? See, get the tone. Oh, I know he'll rise at the last day, but that doesn't give us our brother tomorrow. And I wouldn't doubt but that the girls were pretty much dependent on him for their income. I don't know, but they're upset because he's dead. In verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In other words, he's just showing who he is. He's the God of creation. He's in control of life and death. But he doesn't associate any salvation to it. Now, next verse. She, Martha, said unto him, Yea, Lord. Now, watch this. If it isn't word for word what Peter said back in chapter 16. Martha said, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. Period. Not a word about the cross. Not a word about his death. But what did she believe? Who he was. And that's all they were supposed to believe because that's all that had been revealed. You cannot believe something that God has not spoken. And they were not expected to either. All right, one more. Acts chapter 8. And this is plain. My goodness, you don't have to be a seminary professor to see this. It's as plain as day that their profession of faith was based on who Jesus was. Acts chapter 8. Philip who has been up to Samaria, and the Spirit has instructed him to go on the way down toward Africa, beyond Gaza, the same Gaza that's in the news every day today, down there on the corner of the Mediterranean Sea. All right, and as he's gone down, he sees this probably caravan heading back down south to Africa. And we have the Ethiopian eunuch. And you all know the account. All right, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, that is to Philip now, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to baptize? Now, of course, we don't see up here that Philip said anything about baptism, but he, again, we have to feel that it was implied because it was part and parcel of the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist started with what? Repent and be baptized. Peter in Acts chapter 2 says what? Repent and be baptized. So we have to assume that Philip said the same thing when he preached unto him Jesus Christ, that if he truly believed it, then he should follow that with water baptism. This is the Jewish economy. All right, now verse 37. This is Bible study. This is what you've got to be able to digest. And Philip said, verse 37, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest, that is, be baptized. And he, 
the eunuch answered and said. Now again, watch it. I'm going to throw you another curve. I've already got one strike on you. I'm going to get number two. And now he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for me, shed his blood, and rose from the dead. Have you got a Bible out there that says that? Is there just one? Not a one, is there? Because your Bible doesn't say that. Was this eunuch saved? Absolutely. Did he know anything about death, burial, and resurrection for that salvation? No. What did he know? Who Jesus was. Now, have you got the picture? That was the gospel of the kingdom. That Jesus was the promised Messiah and King of Israel, and he was ready to bring in that earthly kingdom promised ever since Abraham and Isaac and David and the rest of the Old Testament. But he couldn't set up that kingdom until Israel recognized who he was. And so even as these writers of the little epistles now will never mention anything concerning the cross for salvation. Now Peter makes reference, of course, to his death and that he's alive, but not for salvation. That's what you have to look for. Now here I've made it so plain in 1 John. Now come back with me a minute. 1 John, he's made it so plain that if they believe that Jesus was the Son of God, then they are being led by the right spirit. And if a spirit that says he was not who he claimed to be, then they're following a false spirit. All right, now then, how much time we got left? Put me a plague. Okay, we got 10 minutes left. I think I've got time. Now let's go back and see what this other apostle, the one not associated with the 12 whatsoever, he was kept separate from them as much as possible. Come back with me to Paul's writing to the Corinthians. And my, what a difference in the language. And then people come and tell me all the time that when they confront Sunday school teachers and pastors with this, they say, uh-uh, you can't listen to Les Feldick. There's never been more than one gospel. And then I have to come back and I just ask a logical question. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did the twelve preach death, burial, and resurrection when they didn't even have a clue that it was going to happen? No. And yet that's all that Paul knows. And then you're going to sit there and tell me that they preach the same thing? How could they? Common sense. Just common sense. They couldn't preach the same thing because Paul's gospel hasn't been revealed yet. But here's Paul's gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. My, just flies in the face of Jesus and John the Baptist and the twelve. Because it's a whole different ballgame. Paul is now preaching to the Gentile world. Jesus and the twelve are with Israel. Now look what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 17. For Christ, now remember, he is the apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And he never lets us forget that. That it was Jesus Christ who confronted him on the road to Damascus. It was Jesus Christ who taught him those three years in the desert. And he always is alluding to the fact that he is merely the, the mouthpiece, if I may use that word, for the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. All right, for Christ, verse 17, sent me not to baptize. Oh, people don't like to read that, do they? He didn't send me to baptize. Well, he sent John to baptize but not Paul. All right, so he sent me not to baptize, but to what? Preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, right off the bat, what's number one in his thinking? The cross. The cross. Now, verse 18. Here's why. For the preaching of of the cross, not his messiahship, his crucifixion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, lost people, foolishness. 
Don't you hear it every once in a while? I do. What does what happened 2,000 years ago have to do with me today? That's the scoffer's question. Well, everything. Everything. Because that was the very culmination of all of God's dealing with the human race, past, present, and future. All right, so the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, lost people, foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. All right, now come on down. Verse 23. But we, Paul says, preach Christ the miracle worker? No. We preach Christ the Messiah? No. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block because they couldn't comprehend that anything good would come out of Nazareth. And so the reaction was, away with him. All right? And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Foolishness. Who ever heard of such a thing? of willing to go to a Roman cross, supposedly to die for the sins of mankind. That's foolishness. All right? Then verse 25, But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. All right, now come on over still in 1 Corinthians to chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now here's the gospel for the Gentile. Here's the gospel that Paul is constantly proclaiming. Here's the gospel that saves mankind today, not just believing that Jesus is the Son of God, although that's a prerequisite. The Christ of the cross, of course, is the Son of God. No doubt about that. All right, but now look in chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, as he writes to these Corinthian Gentiles, I declare unto you the gospel. It's singular which I preached unto you, and which also you received, and wherein you as believers stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you have believed in vain. Now here comes Paul's gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Where did he get it? The ascended Lord. How that? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. See, you don't see language like that in Peter, James, and John. It's not in there. But Paul can proclaim that Christ died for our sins according to the Old Testament. He was buried, and he rose again the third day. That's the gospel. That Christ, the Son of God, the Creator of everything, went to that Roman cross where God poured out all of his wrath and judgment, but also poured out all of his what? Mercy. The twofold work of the cross. All of the wrath of God that the human race deserved was poured out on him. That's why he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was God's wrath being poured out. But on the other hand, when we see a little later in this chapter, the big word propitiation, he also then became the seat of mercy. And so that's why I proclaim without, without any apology. You don't have to cry out the sinner's prayer. You don't have to say, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's already been done. God has already poured out his mercy on sinful men when he poured it out at the cross. And so it's, yes, it's a twofold work. The wrath of God was poured out on him, but also he became the very mercy seat. He became the epitome of God's forgiveness and reconciliation and mercy to everyone that believes it. Now, that brings up another point. I didn't intend to do that. Is there another belief system on the planet that can do that? Not a one. There is not a belief system. Now, I'm using that instead of the word that I hate, religion. I just don't like the word. It just rubs me wrong. Otherwise, I would say, can you think of another religion? <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, can you think of another belief system? 
Can you? Not a one. Not a one can proclaim that their belief system, the creator of the universe, took on human flesh so that he could satisfy the demands of a holy and a righteous God by shedding his blood and by suffering that death of wrath and vexation of God as well as the outpouring of his mercy and then culminate it all with the power of resurrection. There's not another belief system on the planet that can proclaim that. Not a one. And then they jump all over us for being exclusivist. Of course I'm an exclusivist. I'd be contrary to scripture if I weren't. Nothing rankles me more than somebody says, well, all the paths come to the same pond. No, they don't. No, they don't. All the other paths are going to anything but a pond. <laughs> yeah. But all, oh, listen, all Paul knows the gospel, how that Christ, died for our sins and rose from the dead. You believe it, plus nothing. Now, here's the other point I wanted to make. As soon as we believe that gospel, not only do we experience sins forgiven, not only are we, as Paul says in Romans 5, 1, that the grace of God that bringeth the peace with God, only because we've believed it. All right, now this is what we get letter after letter after letter. Had almost 300 of them yesterday, didn't we? Honey and I just opened letters all afternoon. <laughs> and so many of them will say the same thing. For the first time in my life, I have a hunger for this book. I can't get enough of it. Why? Because when you become a believer, that's just like the new born baby is going to squall for what? Milk. And this is what we're finding, that people are all of a sudden getting struck with the interest of this book. There's nothing like it. It's the most exciting book between two covers. But you have to understand how it's put together. You have to be able to separate. 30 seconds? Is that right? That means I've got to wind down. Okay, here we are. Paul's gospel based on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. These other men are simply saying, believe who Jesus was. What a difference. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.